Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hope you had a nice and relaxed lunch. Uh, good morning to Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie, can you hear? Hi. Yes, I can hear you, yes, sir. Okay, very good. So, uh, uh, so we just will start in a minute. Can uh, the slides be seen, yes, sir? Are the slides visible? Yeah, the slide, yeah we can see the, uh, the, the, the first slide. Looks all okay. good. So if you have any questions, please use the mic. Otherwise, he won't be able to hear your questions or comments. So. Yes, sir. It's two thirty. Hi, hi, Ronnie. Uh, so we can start now. Uh, so let's welcome uh, Ronnie Tomale from the University of Würzburg, Germany, uh, who's going to talk about uh, Kagome metals. Uh, this afternoon session will have two talks. So the first afternoon session, and it'll be both about frustrated metallic behavior uh, in Kagome systems, and the first talk by Ronnie Tomale, followed by that of Philipp Gegenwart from Augsburg. Uh, so uh, let's welcome Ronnie and. Uh, uh, Ronnie, your stage is yours now. Or rather, Thank you, yes, sir. Um, so, can I be heard? Yeah. So, the audio yes. is fine, right? It's perfect. Okay, great. So, Thank you all for coming to Bangalore. I wished I could be there with you, um, but just for private reasons, this didn't turn out to be viable for me. Anyways, great to have all of you there, both in person and on your computers. And let me start off this afternoon session with an introductory presentation on a field that has emerged, I would say, in the past three, four years uh, that affirms by the name Kagobi Metals. And being aware of that this is in its emphasis, a frustrated magnetism conference, let me start to get you in touch with the problem first, why these cargo metals are interesting and why um, certain motives that you are well known to um, from cargo and ferromagnets magnets might carry over to these interesting systems. So I'll tell you a little bit of what happened in the past years and why there's so much interest at the moment in these uh, systems. Um, and um, I will follow this up by analyzing the Kagome Hubbard model um, from a weak to intermediate coupling perspective. And if I have time left, I'll move on to some more exotic domains that we might be able to endeavor through these Kagome uh, systems that have now appeared. Um, let me pick up where many of you have worked on, like the old times when you, when you would talk to people and say, hey, I work on the Kagome lattice, a natural association would be frustrated magnetism. And the reason is simple. There's a lot of uh, very appreciable features of mod limit Kagome lattices uh, prone to the formation of unconventional frustrated quantum magnetic behavior. And one of the systems that people got most familiar with is Herbert Smithite, where for a long time, um, this was regarded the number one a domain for the stabilization of a spin liquid. And for a long time, people weren't sure what kind of spin liquid it is. There were science papers written on that this could be a Z2 um, uh, gapped uh, spin liquid. Um, however, due to very important work by one of the organizers, Yasser Iqbal, it at some point it later turned out that this is, if it's there without too strong disorder, uh, it should be an interesting host for a U1 Dirac spin liquid. So already the Kagome antiferon magnet has a huge history uh, in frustrated magnetism, and many people in the field 
Frédéric Mila, Didier Paul Blanc, um, Steve White, uh, and many, many other people um, that I'm just blanking right now um, have worked on this problem and have made their mark in this field. But this were all times, and as I said, frustrated magnetism typically implies that we are form that that the electronic system forms a mod insulator and the kinetic degree of freedom is basically gone and all the electrons do is interacting through their local spin one half degree of freedom. Now, what can happen when you have a more itinerant perspective on carbon magnets? This is really what happened in these iron tin compounds in 2018, where the expression carbon metals really originated from. So what are these systems like? In short, I believe it's well summarized by um, this sketch in the middle of this slide, you basically accomplish a cargo lattice of um, iron atoms um, sur um, surrounded by tin in the hexagonal center. And you, as for the honeycomb lattice, you get the raccoons. And uh, when you break down the system from a symmetry unbroken state to the full state, there's a good way to view the system as follows. You just assume there is no time reversal, time reversal symmetry breaking, no mechanism whatsoever. So you would just have the rockons. This is the sketch B uh, in the upper right uh, plot that I show you that's taken from the nature paper by Joe Chekelsky's group at MIT. Then you assume uh, an itinerant ferromagnet, which means that one spin species is gone. And then you further add the spin orbit coupling due to the tin in particular, and you end up with gapped uh, spin polarized Dirac cones. And this system proved to be invaluable for um, realizing a large um, anomalous Hall effect in these systems, or you can even call it giant anomalous Hall effect by placing the Fermi level in the insulating regime between the valence Dirac band and the conduction Dirac band. And all this had certain, um, um, uh, certain further unfolding. Um, uh, there was a related compound like iron tin where people uh, witnessed similar physics, but this is still an, a particular type of metal, right? Uh, we still have an itinerant ferromagnet really. So if we think uh, from the frustrated magnets perspective, the thing that is gone is that we're not in the mod limit anymore, but instead we still have itinerant electrons that witness itinerant formation of magnetism. And yet there was a new wave of compounds where you don't just have a time reversal symmetry broken itinerant magnet, but you have a true honest to God metal with no further symmetries broken. And this was first accomplished in papers by um, uh, Gerardo Ortiz and Steve Wilson from UCSB, they grew the samples. And one of the first papers on the topic was by uh, Said Hassan, I'll come to that later on, uh, where we also contributed theoretically. Uh, so what's the system here? The system is again, well, it's a cargo lattice, but now the cargo lattice is not formed by iron or copper as back in Herbert Smithite, but by vanadium. And you see the principal sketch of these systems plotted here. So you have the star of David formed by the vanadium atoms. Then you have the antimony in the trigonal centers and you have the potassium or another rare earth for that matter in the hexagonal centers. That's really how the projected version looks. And to the left-hand side of the slide, you can see how the 3D version of the system looks. And from the start, people got really amazed by what the system has to offer experimentally. And I probably won't have time to get into all details, just to give you an idea, I checked lately, there's more than 350 or close to 400 papers that have been written on this topic in the past two years that shows you how vibrant this system has become and how interesting it will also be in the future. Let me just give you the main points why people are so fascinated by it. You don't see any kind of magnetism, at least not superficially. Instead, you see a very prominent charge density wave that extends all the way up to 90 Kelvin. And 
you see a, a superconducting phase, which shows a two dome behavior as a function of pressure. So first you have sort of an, a transition from charge density wave to superconductivity, but then the TC, as you can see in the left hand slide, witnesses the second dome behavior as we are pushing the pressure further. Now, this can be interpreted in many different ways. Let me just leave you with this first impression that people looked for this for a very long time. Because what really happens on top of just having a superconductor and a charge density wave, there's also a lot of evidence for time reversal symmetry breaking. Now in physics, we are used to time reversal symmetry breaking in the context of magnetism. But whenever time reversal symmetry breaking happens without the presence of magnetism, it is a very special thing. And the theory on this and the experimental efforts on all these questions are ongoing. And I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Uh, for the time being, let me just give you an introduction to the principal phenomenology of what could possibly happen in such Kagome metals. And um, sometimes you're just lucky as a theorist. I just happened to decide to work on this problem years before the experiment was there. And uh, we wrote uh, among the first papers on the topic and why we were interested in that, I'll tell you in a second. Um, I want to build up our understanding of this metal from the opposite limit of what you're typically used to. So we're departing from the strong coupling limit. We get there in the end, but let's start with weak coupling, where everything is controlled, where we can do perturbation theory, where we can ask what kind of family surface instabilities we're supposed to expect. And there, let me just get, probably all of you know this, let me be quick on that, uh, but some of you maybe are just so used to the mod insulator that you don't care about band structures anymore. Uh, let me still so sort of refresh your memory. So the Kagome lattice consists of three sub lattices, colored red, blue, and green. In the inset to the left side, to the left bottom of the slide, you have two dispersive bands that look identical to graphene, and you have a flat band. Now, whoever is familiar with the Mielke construction of flat bands, that's an exactly flat band via the Mielke construction. So bottom line, you take a droplet of a Kagome lattice and you can create, if you just assume nearest neighbor hopping, you can create N minus one localized states for N sides. Now, which, now as soon as you add the two homotopy modes, as you impose uh, the periodic boundary conditions from the droplet, you get n plus one localized modes, which basically fills up for one band plus one additional state. And that explains why the dispersive bands are necessarily touching the Kagome band in this limit. Um, so this is all well understood. Uh, and typically people get interested in flat bands. They could get interested in drug cones. And some people get interested in von Hofer points because they, um, uh, prop up any type of interaction effect because of the large density of states accumulating at Van Hover singularity. And what is so great about these cargo metals, in one way or the other, you have everything here. You have Dirac cones, you have Van Hover singularities of very special kind, which I'll show you in a second, and you even have flat band physics. So basically, whatever you like, as long as you get the Fermi level there, you can see tremendously interesting physics in cargo metals. For our talk, let me constrain myself to the domain where the vanadium antimony compounds are located, and that's at pristine filling, which is half filling. Now, half filling, which becomes already clear from the Kagome lattice band structure in the simple possible way, only one orbital and so on, and just three bands due to three substances, is quite close to the von Hover already. Remember that when you have graphene, the third band is gone, so obviously you're pinned to the Dirac filling. But when you have the third band, you're very you're you're decently close to the adjacent um, Van Hover singularity when you're at half filling in these cargo metals. Um, let me skip that for a moment. I want to get to a main point, and I don't want to um, spare too much time on those things. I want to get you the main messages here. I mean, obviously we did a lot of work on this, but I want to get you the main ideas. The crucial idea, I believe, that explains the majority of all phenomena 
related to cargo metals in the itinerant symmetry unbroken limit can be summarized which by what I called back then subless interference. And I made the following observation back then. Let's place ourselves to the Van Hover singularity and look at the Fermi surface the way it looks when you have nearest neighbor hybridization. It looks like a hexagon within a hexagon and at Van Hover filling, you see the dashed line, I placed the Fermi level right at Van Hover filling, but there's something very interesting related to the Fermi level eigenstates. I color them in a particular way, namely, I take the Fermi level eigenstate and ask how it distributes into three different sub lattices. And now as I walk along the Fermi surface, I notice that as I walk along the Fermi surface, the majority of contribution changes from one sub lattice to the other. If you see this to the right side of the slide, how the different sub lattice occupancies change as I walk along the Fermi surface. Now, what's the consequence of this? If I look at such a Fermi surface where the majority of density of states is located at the Hover points, which are the three inequivalent endpoints, which is where the Fermi surface um, um, touches the Brayer zone corner, you see that these three majority points of electronic density of states all characterized by independent um, sub lattices. So at one end point, there's family eigenstates that live on the red sub lattice. On the other end point, there's just uh, states, there's just density of states that lives on the green sub lattice. And on the other end point, there's density of states that lives on the blue sub lattice. Now, when you're talking about family surface instabilities, the natural thing that happens is you start connecting the points of maximum density of states. And as you are doing this, you would be connect, naturally connecting the inequivalent endpoints. However, when you do this on the Kagomi lattice, you notice that you're connecting family level eigenstates that live on different sub lattices. Now, what does that mean? If I write down a local Hubbard U matrix element between a family level eigenstate at one endpoint and a family level eigenstate at another endpoint, I get zero because the local Hubbard U can't connect electronic density of states that lives on opposite sub lattices. And this type of subtlety has a huge impact on the effective interactions you see in the Kagome metal. And uh, probably, I, I don't know how many nature papers have been written in the past two years. There's at least 10 or 15 just on these Kagome metals. And I believe that the majority of them Finds, um, uh, find their root in this mechanism. Because what it really does is it propagates, it em emphasizes the nearest neighbor repulsion. All nearest neighbor interaction terms get propped up because of this matrix element effect imposed on the local interactions. So that's something that we rarely see in, 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 in family surface instabilities Typically, they are dominated by local interactions. And the takeaway message here is that sublattice interference in the Kagome Hubbard model allows you to have an effective system in which the nearest neighbor interactions are enormously relevant as compared to the local interactions. And that drives all the physics that I'll tell you in a second. So I'll keep, I'll stop that. Well, maybe I should make some, some claims here. There was a theorem, so to speak, by Srinivas Ragu, Steve Kivelson, and Doug Scalapino that said that when you turn on longer range interactions, TC has to go down in the weak coupling limit. And they claim that this is a theorem. Now, because of sublattice interference, actually, I could show that the Kagome uh, Hubbard model is a counterexample to that theorem. Because as you now turn on, longer range interactions, all of a sudden you can exploit more strongly the density of states at the Van Hover points. And as a consequence, you also can increase TC. But that's not the main point of, uh, of this talk. Let me rather go into this most interesting regime, namely intermediate coupling, where, where we are starting to approach the frustrated limit, uh, the frustrated magnet domain, at least from the other side of the mod. Uh, of, the, of the mod level. And 
Well, the method we use is called functional randomization group. If you're interested in reading up on it, the first paper was written by saint Shi and Schulz in 99, and many, many papers followed since then. If you want to read one of our reviews, it's listed here. It's an advances in physics from 2014. But let me rather get you to the main results. And what we did is knowing that the sublattice interference is vital in these cargo metals, we from the start not just included an on-site Hubbard interaction, but also a nearest neighbor Hubbard interaction. And that's the phase diagrams you get either right at Van Hover filling or uh, in, 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 in the neighborhood of the Van Hover filling. And while I don't have a lot of time to go through all these phases, let me rationalize the phase diagrams a little bit for you. So first of all, you see that when the on-site Hubbard U dominates over the nearest U, the cargo metals should be dominated by ferromagnetism. Well, this is obvious because you just have a suppression of the finite Q matrix elements, but the Q equals zero matrix elements, you obviously don't suppress. And since the Q equals zero fluctuations are then propped up by comparison to the finite Q fluctuations, this propagates the formation of ferromagnetism, by the way, as you see even in iron tin in the, in the Tchaikovsky uh, compounds that then immediately showed ferromagnetic behavior. So there's a very suggestive tone to it just by looking at the Hubbard model. However, if we now allowed ourselves to have a finite uh, U1, you see that there are phases that are typically very hard to come by in generic Hubbard models. There's a prominent Pomeranchuk instability labeled PI. There's spin bond order and charge bond order, which are probably orders you hardly haven't heard of unless you're really into the matter of exotic thermosurface instabilities, or you know piles instabilities by heart and their higher dimensional generalizations. And you see F-wave superconductivity, which again, is not so easy to come by in a generic condensed matter system, because typically the singlet favoring fluctuations dominate sooner or later and give a strong bias towards singlet type superconductivity formation. Um, let me go, through these shortly, I know I don't have very much time on that for that. So charge and spin bond order really is something amazing. I would say that we have uh, that we that we had theoretically uh, discovered in 2013. So in these in the Kagami Harbor model. So uh, what is happening here? Um, you have translation symmetry breaking, but since you have three Van Hove points. You have three characteristic nesting vectors, Q1, Q2, Q3, which all set in at the same time. And the, the, the resulting order is a 12 side order, a 12 side unit cell. And people could also call it a two by two order simply because um, a, a unit cell on the cargo letters has three sides to begin with. So when the new unit cell has, has 12, you can also call it a two by two ordering on the cargo lattice, which is what experimentalists prefer to say. So you have the 12 side unit cell. And what happens is the ordering can happen on the bond. And by that, I mean, you see, and the, let me just discuss the charge bond order. The spin bond order is very similar in spirit. You just have an alternating, an alternation of strong bonds and weak bonds along all set of parallel lines in the cargo lattice and taken Independently, these parallel lines really look like piles phases. And that's why I kept saying before that in a way this can remind you of a piles phase really, but it's sort of a piles phase arranged in a two dimensional environment. And um, uh, these, uh, these charge bond orders, they, um, they could form. And what is so interesting about them is that this is a particle whole condensate with finite relative angular momentum. Now that's something very peculiar. Because typically you would expect that when you have a particle hole condensate, because of the opposite charges, the pairing wave function of the particle and the hole should have zero relative angular momentum in order to optimize the attraction between the particle and the hole. Here, however, due to sublattice interference, it, is, it happens such that the bond order becomes energetically preferable. 
And yeah, so that's that's something quite interesting to follow up on. And uh, I'll come to that. I'll come back to that as soon as we see experiments on the cargon metals. Um, maybe something that those of you who are interested in twisted bidigraphene might want to mention, might want to notice is that the Kagami Hubbard model was also the first instance of witnessing a Fermi surface instability um, into a nematic phase where the point group symmetry that is broken relates to a two dimensional irreducible point group representation. So typically, Whenever people discuss nematicity on the square lattice, for instance, in the nictites or even in the cuprates, then typically it's related to a one-dimensional irreducible representation. Whereas here, the, relevant, the, the irreducible representation question is two-dimensional. And that is a, a motive that we had seen in 2013 that now reappears in the context of twisted bilayer graphene, because similarly, the hexagonal lattice symmetry suggests an E2 irreducible um, uh, point group representation, which could be subject to nematicity, uh, a precursor of which is the Pomeranchuk Pumera instability. So that's what we've seen there already in 2013. And we also mentioned, we also noticed that because of sublattice interference, the F wave superconductivity appears strongly preferred, but this is distracting us too much. So let me just move on here and tell you what was found. So I think Sahid Hassan was among the first scientists who got his hands on the samples of Steve uh, Wilson uh, in Santa Barbara. So he did STM measurements and he instantly saw this two by two order. And he uh, sort of remembered, I don't know how, but so somehow we got back in touch and he remembered that we had worked on this before, like eight years ago, before he did these measurements. And then we started talking again about what the origin of this charge order could be. And so uh, the STM imaging and the STM evidence up to now can be summarized as follows. There's unambiguous evidence for the translation symmetry breaking according to the two by two order, uh, like this, uh, according to the three, um, uh, nesting vectors related to the Van Hove filling, which I explained to you before. And further details are still in question, I would say. For instance, question of nematicity are not fully settled. Questions of time reversal symmetry breaking seem to be settled. There is strong evidence from mu and spin resonance. Um, there's evidence from um, SDM, but no direct evidence, you know. For instance, there is no direct measurement up to now of orbital currents. And when you look at Kerr effect, for instance, there's also still, it's still a contentious issue. There are still different groups saying different things. So I, I believe further details of the problem are not yet settled, but it's quite obvious that the type of order that you see here with the three Qs and so is going the direction of the analysis that I had shown you before that already surfaces in the Kagomi Hubbard model. But it's also clear that when we have vanadium at hand and we, we have multiple, multiple orbitals that, in, that are involved in the low energy theory, any low energy theory should be much more complicated than just the Kagomi Hubbard model alone. So clearly there's no one-to-one, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence expected between the Hubbard model uh, between the Kagobi Hubbard model and the uh, microscopic modeling of these compounds. And that's something we also should get used to once this field of Kagobi metals is unfolding. Some people have been spoiled in the one band Hubbard model and its relation to cuprates that it took us, uh, that it got us so far. I don't think that the Hubbard model alone gets us very far, but it gives us a playground to establish the motives that hopefully carry over to these more complicated band structures. And to give you an idea of how to minimally extend and expand on the Kagami Hubbard model to approach a decent description of these Kagami metals, let me just shortly at the end of the talk uh, highlight how this could go. So what we did is we, we, we tried to impose a two orbital modeling. We took those two, two orbitals that are even under mirror symmetry. 
such that they don't have overlaps with the p orbitals of antimony. That was our motivation to pick them. And what you come up with is the band structure you see below. You see, um, you see that there's multiple von Hofer singularities. That's obviously an unavoidable thing as soon as you have multiple orbitals. You have multiple sets of bands, so you have not just one von Hofer level or two, uh, for that matter. You have several ones, and this is the essential added complication as one is approaching these systems. We did a careful analysis of the charge density wave order in the system and made several conclusions on this, which are now followed up on uh, from an experimental viewpoint. So basically, there can be time reversal symmetry breaking in the charge density wave, but that doesn't have to be. So what we did back then in 2013 was only an analysis of the instability, but not of the phase itself. Now you would have to include higher order contributions in the Ginzburg-Landau formulation and possibly get onset symmetry break-ins uh, symmetry break that you wouldn't see at the instability level. And this is now a question of numbers and a question of better microscopic modeling of these systems. Um, superconductivity in the system is still a big issue. And there are some incredibly interesting proposals. For instance, uh, a pair density wave, uh, a pair density wave superconductor. Um, there's a lot of evidence for unconventional symmetry, uh, unconventional uh, superconductivity, at least for that superconducting dome that is adjacent to the CDW. Um, but again, this, these things are still in flow and um, there are no clear unanimous conclusions at this point. So I don't want to blur your mind with my current opinion on it. Let me just um, shortly highlight what the motive is that I find most interesting. So let's assume for a moment it could be unconventional. Now, when you look at a typical cuprate phase diagram, um, the unconventional superconductor in the cuprates is dominated by the spin fluctuation paradigm. So everyone who worked on unconventional superconductor got raised with the principal notion that if you, have, if you want to have unconventional pairing, so basically you need spin fluctuations that then basically seed an attraction uh, of a particle-particle condensate. Now, when you look at this phase diagram again, this can't be it here. So instead, we don't have a spin fluctuation paradigm, but we have a charge fluctuation paradigm. And that I think is quite fascinating and the implications of it are still under debate. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is that uh, I mentioned a lot about this particular von Hove singularity close to half filling, where we would have three endpoints dominated by three individual sub legacies. Um, we did a full classification of this, and there's two types of von Hove singularities in the Kagome lattice. There's one where you have this, you can call it vorticity if you like, uh, that I had mentioned before, but there's also another von Hove filling where each endpoint is not classified by one sublattice alone, by an admixture of two. And we call this in one of our papers, we coined the expression P-type and M-type von Hover points, P for pure and M for mixed. And uh, one year ago or one and a half years ago in two independent experimental papers, uh, some of uh, um, both uh, this, this claim was experimentally verified and angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy on these carbon metals. So they could measure the independent nature of P type and M type von Hover points. And the admixture of P type and M type von Hover points is most likely also the relevant parameter to decide what the superconducting nature of these carbon metals would be from the viewpoint of um, unconventional pairs. Um, maybe, um, Yasser, I don't think I have time for Hakagome hydrodynamics, I believe, right? I should probably uh, move on to the question section. Uh, you have a few minutes, like four, five minutes, and then we have a couple of minutes for questions. Aha, uh -huh, okay. So, okay, maybe, uh, yeah, okay, I tried to be quick. So, um, I believe that without any um, exaggeration, that all of us got interested in frustrated Kagome magnets for many different reasons. But on top of that, the domains of frustrated metallicity 
that the cargo Miletus has to offer will give us a tremendous domain of uncharted territory. And just to give you a glimpse of another direction, which we embarked on lately, is something we call cargo hydrodynamics. And for that reason, um, it, what, is the, what is the takeaway message here? Take Herbert Smithide and just for the sake of the argument, allow yourself to assume that we could replace um, uh, all zinc uh, by some three plus atom, for instance, scandium or gallium. If you do that, you would, um, you would enforce the electronic filling to be right at the Van Hove, uh, not, not, I'm sorry, right at the Dirac point. And then at the Dirac point, we would have electronic states dominated by d orbitals. And when they are dominated by d orbitals, uh, this would be something quite interesting. This was a work with Rosé Valenti, with um, 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 uh, Frank Lechermann, um, with Harald Jeschke. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. This was an old work uh, from 2014 or so. What we did afterwards is this. Um, we just calculated um, by more sophisticated methods with uh, Tim Deling, uh, we by, by CRPA analysis, we calculated the, um, the fine structure constant, the effective fine structure constant in such a strongly correlated Dirac method. And we would find that the scandium Herbert Smithite that we talked about in 2014, turns out to be to have a record high fine structure constant. Now, why is this relevant? So Dirac cone materials naturally provide a good arena for potential hydrodynamics. But if so, you always want to ask what, how strong is alpha? Because alpha determines the regime of the hydrodynamics you are in. Since the Reynolds number uh, depends on, uh, very sensitively depends on the fine structure constant. And when you have a very weak fine structure constant, you can just do Boltzmann theory to approach the hydrodynamic regime because Boltzmann effectively is an expansion in alpha. But when you have an alpha that is bigger than one, as we could accomplish in this uh, scandium herbert smithite you need to approach the hydrodynamics from a different viewpoint. And luckily there is one, namely ADS-CFT. And ADS-CFT converts the problem into a gravitational problem and then performs perturbation theory, not in alpha, but in one over alpha. And that would of course be best in order to tackle the strongly correlated um, Kagome hydrodynamics as we would hope to see it if scandium Herbert Smith had can be synthesized. As an aside, what I very much like about that too is the bigger alpha is the more likely the electronic hydrodynamic regime is to, is, uh, is to be turbulent. So it could be a very nice direction to even create turbulent electron hydrodynamics um, in a cargo system. This was just as a spotlight. Uh, I don't, didn't have time to get into this. Let me summarize. I think this field of cargo metals has only begun to unfold. Uh, as we speak, there's new systems, there's bilayers, there might be twisted cargo layers. There, there can be non-vanadium-based cargo metals, and so on and so forth. And I believe this 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 topic will stay stay with us for a while. Uh, let me thank uh, my collaborators. Uh, I give you some of the papers below, and let me thank you for your attention. Ronnie, for a, for a wonderful talk. Uh taking us to the exciting developments taking place in the field of metallic cargo systems. Uh, so we can now entertain some questions if you have. Uh, Harold. Yeah. Um, hi, Ronnie. Thank you very much for this nice overview talk. Um, can you, I mean, we all know what we mean with frustrated magnetism. Can you please explain the term frustrated metallicity a little bit? Yes. And of course, it is not very strictly defined at this point, but I believe one can talk about it like this. Uh, frustration, um, I think Toulouse caught the expression in the context of frustrated magnetism. Hopefully I'm right on this. Um, certainly Toulouse was the, main, uh, was the main contributor in the early days to this notion of frustration. 
Um, in, in, in the context of metal, I would call, I would use the word frustration when the typical fluctuation mechanisms that would lead us to the common suspect orders are either suppressed or challenged by competitive fluctuation channels. And the Kagome metal, due to the sublattice interference, allows un, unheard of, uh, an, un, an unheard of competition of different family surface instabilities. You really, you really see how the thing is turned upside down. If the on-site Hubbard U were dominant in these Kagome metals, you would have seen, I bet with you, you, would have, you wouldn't have seen a charge density wave, you would have seen a spin density wave, and you would have a very standard domain of physics. But now that you have um, a competitive pairing mechanism in the particle hole condensates and the particle particle condensates that derive from nearest neighbor interactions because of the suppression of on site interactions, at least within the dominant fluctuation channels. Um, I would say this reminds me very much of some motives that are prone to frustrated magnetism, which is why I would say that uh, frustrated metallicity is probably not so bad of a word because it tries to encompass the uh, unfolding diversity of potential um, formation channels the metal can witness in such a setting. Uh, any further questions? Any more comments? Uh, Ludovic Jobert has a question, so let's just give me a minute. You have the mic? Okay. Hi, Honey, it's Ludovic. Hi, Ludovic. Uh, uh, I was wondering, um, you've shown at the beginning of your talk, you've shown the, the band structure of the Kagome lattice with yes. the uh, dispersion bands and the flat bands at the top. I was wondering, I mean, as a, as a theorist, uh, if you uh, would be interesting to consider like a breathing Kagome lattice where it's possible to move the flat bands uh, below and like in between the dispersive ones. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, first of all, I should have mentioned uh, a couple of more details here. I mean, you're of course perfectly aware of this, but I forgot to mention this. This is a non bipartite lattice. So T to minus T is not a gauge transform anymore. So depending on the sign of the hybridization element, this flat band either touches above from the dispersive bands or from below. And on top of that, Ludovic, you, you were mentioning that one can adjust even the position of the flat band and shift it into the dispersive bands. That's what you said. Yeah, this is all very, um, in principle, quite interesting. The point I'm trying to get at is, what is so sensational at the moment is, if you had chosen a favorite filling to get to a system where interaction effects and family surface instability formation is prominent, you would like the cargo millennials exactly as it is, because at half filling, you're already quite close to the Van Hover filling. Um, imagine, maybe, maybe you remember the days when people really tried hard to get Fermi surface instabilities in graphene. This was a time 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, around this time where people really desperately tried to dope the, cargo, the, 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 the graphene lattice away from the Dirac-Hon filling, closer to the Van Hover singularities, but this would take them 14% doping, which is impossible to accomplish experimentally. I think from this more profane angle, what is so great about the Kagome lattice, you get the proximity of the Van Hove singularities basically for free. And um, all the physics that people talk about when it comes to Van Hove singularities can be seen experimentally without a huge effort of, 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 electric, uh, of chemical doping which typically uh, imposes so much horrible disorder that uh, it becomes a story of its own. Maybe a little bit like Herbert Smith, where people claim that a disorder is really a, another story overlay on the actual Herbert Smith story. Um, so, so here, uh, coming back to this metal, I, I fully agree with you, but one should, one should keep in mind that 
the generic filling of these cargo metals is already exactly where it should be from the viewpoint of family service instabilities. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ludovic. Long time since we saw each other. Yeah. Yes, quite some time, yes. Yeah. Hopefully soon. That's why yeah. I was requesting you to come to Bangalore. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, that's the thank Ronnie. I think we already over time, unless there's an immediate question or someone from the uh, online participants. Uh, there's a chat mentioning. There's a, I there's a chat uh, question. So, should we. Uh, uh, no, Yogesh sent me an email. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, that's just for you. That's okay, for you. okay. You okay. can answer that question privately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> okay, then uh, let's thank Ronnie for a very nice talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you sometime soon then. Yeah, thank you very much. So the next speaker of the session is uh, Philip Gegenwart from the University of Augsburg. Uh, who will continue uh, uh, telling us about more developments taking place from the experimental front on the uh, Kagome metals, uh, rare earth Kagome metals. So, uh, Philippe, welcome to this uh, conference, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. It's all uh, clear and loud, yeah? Great. Uh, so, thanks very much for this opportunity. So that's really a distinct topic. So in my case, I will discuss metallic uh, magnets, which feature local 4F-based magnetic moments. Nevertheless, the uh, interaction with conduction electrons will lead to interesting phenomena. So these are materials which are crystallizing on the zirconium nickel aluminum type structure, where we will put rare earth atoms on these locations uh, with the large black dots which form a distorted Kagome lattice. And the first example I will mention is holmium silver germanium, where we recently found the first crystalline realization of a two dimensional spin eye state. And uh, we're, more recently, we see very interesting uh, coupling to the, um, to the conduction electrons, which, uh, which gives rise to interesting Hall and magneto resistance behaviors. And while here we have a negligible condo effect, there is also, of course, a question what happens if you, um, if you get to um, heavy fermion metals or condo lattices where the F electrons are placed on this uh, cargo mill lattice. And here we also have some interesting new developments. One is that for the heavy fermion serum palladium aluminum, we see a, a broad pressure range where the um, with a new um, microscopic uh, experiment indicated spin liquid behavior, and where we also see indication for quantum criticality. And, and, and the other, and the last topic of my talk will be a material theory iridium tin, where we are even having a much, much higher condo interaction. So there we are deep in the intermediate valence regime. And uh, fascinating enough, um, at uh, temperatures and energies more than two orders of magnitude below the characteristic valence fluctuation energy, we see the emergence of anti magnetic moments at, uh, at low temperatures. And that may hint to the competition between mag magnetic frustration and condo zinclet formation and could, could be an indication of a possible condo breakdown in this material class. So before starting with, uh, with my talk, I'd like to acknowledge the main collaborators. The first topic, holmium silver germanium, was uh, initiated by my uh, former postdoc, Kan Chao, who is now at Baihang University. And, and we got uh, great support by all those people listed here. In particular, I'd like to mention Hua Chen from Colorado State, who uh, did the recent uh, theoretical analysis of our magneto transport data. Then uh, silver and palladium aluminum, that's also a long collaboration this, uh, with uh, uh, Veronika Fritsch and Oliver Stockert. And the new data I'd like to show you were obtained by May Mayuk Mayumda, who was also a postdoc in my group and who is now a faculty member in India. And the third topic, this is a quite international collaboration. So there we got the crystals from uh, Japan, from Hiroshima University, Takapatake Group, the, um, the uh, synchrotron spectroscopy 
uh, to study the intermediate valence regime was done by Andrea Severing and collaborators. And we got important uh, microscopic insight by MERS R and, uh, and neutron scattering by Atrocha from ISIS. And my uh, former PhD student, Andreas Wuerl, actually did the bulk millikelvin experiment. All right, so um, the, uh, the motivation to look for magnetic frustration is, of course, that it supports unconventional states and excitations. And uh, we define this geometrical magnetic frustration as a way to where we don't, uh, we cannot fully satisfy all the different pairwise interactions. And that leads to interesting new phenomena. If we just consider classical uh, spins, then we uh, can typically have some constraints which uh, define um, the crown state and which lead to a multitude of degenerate states in the, in the low, at the lowest energy, like in the, like in the uh, spin ice cases. And if we, if we also consider no quantum mechanical effects, it's getting more interesting because then many body entanglement and fractionalized excitations uh, uh, may, may become visible. And so if we then also consider some additional uh, conduction electrons in, in, in metallic magnetic, magnetically frustrated materials, we, uh, we can uh, uh, highlight um, observations like uh, new types of Hall effect and in the heavy filament case, condor breakdown of fractionalized Fermi liquid. So uh, I like to start with a brief uh, reminder on the physics of spin eyes. So um, this, um, in a certain class of pyrochlor based virus oxides, we have the um, magnetic moments placed on the, on the edges of such tetrahedral units. And the uh, single ion anisotropy dictates that the magnetic moments can only be aligned towards the center and outwards the center of the tetrahedra. And uh, the lowest energy are having those uh, six out of 16 configurations where always two spins pointing inwards and two spins pointing outwards. And that's a famous uh, spin ice holes. And, um, and uh, there is a residual entropy due to this uh, multiple uh, degenerate configurations, which is clearly visible in the experiments where entropy was collected by, uh, was calculated from the uh, specific heat by just integration. And characteristic for these uh, spin ices is that you have, as once you cool them down to very low, low energies, that there is slow dynamics and freezing uh, and, and time scales are getting extremely long. If we consider excitation, so just uh, flipping one spin would result in two uh, tetrahedra where the ice rule is violated. So that creates a pair of magnetic monopoles and, and this uh, physics of the emergent uh, magnetic monopoles is, is very fascinating. So we can ask whether such spin ice states would also exist in two dimensions. And indeed we can define uh, something like cargo mere spin ice rules where in the uh, where for the triangular units out of which we built the Kagome lattice, we would always have the rule that either two spins are pointing inwards, one outwards, or two spins pointing outwards and one inwards. And uh, there is uh, four such possible configuration indicated here, which uh, fulfill this ice rule. And in the Kagome case, now we would have in the ground state always plus or one magnetic monopole per uh, triangular unit. Now the theory predicts a series of transitions as we cool down such um, Kagomir spin ice. So once we first um, fulfill the ice rule, this separates the ordinary uh, paramagnetic state from the first uh, 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 Kagomir spin ice state. But then there is a long range border of the uh, magnetic monopoles in two steps before we reach this um, this state here, where now by the blue and red dots, we indicate the charge of the monopole at each center of the uh, triangular unit. So, you know, if we connect the centers of the triangular unit, the Kagome lattice, this gives rise to a honeycomb lattice. And this is here the full order of the magnetic charges 
in this uh, in this uh, honeycomb lattice of the monopoles that we have in the cargo mass spin eyes. Now, up to now, experiments on cargo mass spin eyes were limited to uh, magnetic nanostructures, which are based from ferromagnetic thin films in the of a nanometer sized region, which has the um, the, the, the shape anisotropy dictates that the uh, total magnetization of this uh, this uh, this films has to point inwards or outwards the the triangular units. And of course, it would be nice to have a real crystalline material which features the uh, the cargo mass spin ice physics. And uh, and this was really the major discovery by Kan Chao, who found that this physics is realized in uh, holmium silver germanium. The crystal structure of holmium silver germanium is shown here. So it's a layered material where we have these stacks of a distorted cargo lattice of holmium three plus um, uh, ions, and uh, it is an intermetallic compound with a uh, with a uh, resist electrical temperature dependence of electrical resistance, which indicates metallic behavior. There is no condor, no signature of condor uh, scattering, and uh, there is a there is a nice uh, so there is a nice degree of fractional perfection, and the residual resistance is as low as twenty microns anyway. Holmium in the three plus state is a non gramus ion. It has 10 F electrons. And the total spin orbit coupled moment uh, undergoes the crystallectic field splitting. And in fact, here we have uh, four crystal, low energy crystal field modes, which are all within one milli electron volt, which is smaller than the RKQY exchange magnetic coupling. Because you see that the magnetic ordering happens at 12 Kelvin. Which corresponds to about one uh, millielectron volt. So, upon cooling, we see in the magnetic susceptibility uh, several subsequent phase transition, and uh, in the magnetization curve, at, measured at 1.8 Kelvin, this is uh, the black and red data. We see multiple steps and fractionalized magnetization plateaus. So, as you see, the saturated state uh, at low temperature has a magnetic moment of six mu bohr, and we have a first pronounced plateau at one third and a second pronounced plateau at two thirds. And there is also a smaller plateau at one six and another plateau at five six. And these plateaus are separated by the sharp metamagnetic transitions. There's a little hysteresis seen between up and down in the magnetization between the position of this uh, metamagnetic transitions, but there is no, um, but the, there is no hysteresis in the value of the magnetization at the plateau, of course. And I should mention that there is a, the system has the easy plane anisotropy, and the and the in the following I will always show you data where the field was applied in the plane along the b-axis. Now, thanks to his uh, careful work on the crystal crows over many years with the self flux um, method, uh, can realize to grow high quality and large single crystals, which we could then use for very detailed um, um, stru magnetic structure investigation by neutron scattering. And, he, uh, and here I show you already the outcome of a magnetic structure refinement, which is based actually on, the, on, the, on more than 500 peaks detected in neutron refraction. And so let's start with the, uh, in this range of the phase diagram, um, below where the magnetic order uh, develops below 12 Kelvin. So these are data taken at 10 Kelvin and there uh, a partially ordered magnetic state was, uh, was found as a result of the re refinement. Where you see that in each triangular unit, there is always one spin pointing inwards and one outwards and the third spin is, is not yet ordered. And this uh, partially ordered space has a toroidal moment it is drawn here in this configuration in the clockwise sense, but of course there will be a second domain where the where the moments would where the toroidal moment would point anticlockwise. Then there is additional prag peaks appearing below seven Kelvin, and here is the outcome of the refinement at four Kelvin in zero magnetic field, where you now see that now all the magnetic sites participate in the long range order, and uh, the long range order 
can be visualized as such a it's such an ordered version of this uh, toroidal order, which is exactly the same as theoretically predicted for the for the uh, classical Kagome spin ice crown set. And then uh, Khan also did careful measurements in magnetic field and study the magnetic states in the one third, two third, and perturbated state. And these configurations are shown here. And um, without to going too much detail now in this uh, short talk, I'd like to mention that in all these uh, configurations sketched here in all these four different states, there is always the uh, spin ice rule is fulfilled. So you will see that always uh, two spins are pointing inward and one outward, or one spin pointing inward, two pointing outward for each uh, triangular unit. And, uh, and these different states have uh, are twofold degenerate with a similar value of the magnetization. But most interestingly, we see that they yield to different uh, values of the uh, needle resistance and hole conductivity. And that's now a new data, which I show you here on the left part of that slide. So we um, do a um, field sweep here of the magnetization and here of uh, transverse longitudinal resistance and hole effect at two Kelvin once the field increasing and decreasing. And as you see, interestingly, the hole effect as well as the resistances show different values on these plateau states. So obviously there is a there is a the, this uh, this uh, there is an emergent time reversal degeneracy which is which is revealed by this magnetotransport experiments. So despite the fact that the magnetization at the one third and two third plateau has similar value, we see different values in the magnetotransport and the whole data. And Hua Chen helped us to understand this phenomena. And actually he found that this is related to the non-trivial distortion of the Kagome lattice, which we have in our material Holmian serotonin. Because there is this two, um, different states, which while they have featured the same magnetization and, and energy, they, they give rise to a different uh, Berry curvature and thus different uh, magnetotransport properties. These two configurations are actually um, related by a non-trivial operation, which includes a distortion reversal, as indicated here, where the where the individual triangular units change their distortion and then a rotation by pi along the b-axis. And so he uh, did a calculation where he just assumed the minimal tight binding, uh, uh, calculated just a minimal tight binding length structure with S electrons on the positions of the Holmium sites and found that indeed these two configurations have a similar, um, reveal in a similar uh, band structure, but they're, um, their barrier curvature is uh, di distinctly different. So, so not just have an opposite sign for the two different configurations, but with different absolute values. And integration of that then leads to different uh, so-called orbital magnetization and different anomalous Hall effect as indicated here over the prion zone. And that could explain this difference, which we see in this, uh, in this um, uh, time reversal like degenerate uh, state in the magnetization, this difference here in the in the magnetotransport data. So the general relevance of that is that in such structurally distorted magnets where the uh, where the distortion reversal is not equivalent to a magnetic space group operation, we can use the anomalous Hall effect to distinguish these different uh, states which here have op oppositorial orders which have similar magnetization and we can reveal this hidden symmetry by the magnetotransport data. All right, so up to now there was negligible condo interaction. Of course, we can ask what happens if we would replace a holmium with the 10 F electrons by a terbium, which has 13 F electrons. So it's a Karmas ion and which has just one F hole. And you know this one F hole can get unstable and there is a lot of spin fluctuations uh, going on and condo, condo effect can lead to drastic changes of electronic structure. So it is natural to compare the Holmium silver germanium with the terbium silver germanium, which was actually started uh, also uh, quite some while ago. And about 10 years ago, we, we studied it in co collaboration with Volcanfields group and found 
that it has interesting phase diagram, which also consists of several magnetic states, which are separated by metamagnetic transitions. And so there is a sequence of different magnetic phases, but there is important differences to the Kagome spin ice case, namely none of these orders respect the Kagome spin ice rules, but it's more complex order. And uh, more importantly, there is uh, non-family liquid behavior and field induced quantum criticality at the edge between two such uh, phases. So that's uh, that's an example now for such uh, uh, Kagome uh, magnet where the magnetic moments are uh, are condo ions. And for condo materials, of course, we know that the um, there is a competition between the long range magnetic exchange interaction and the on-site uh, condo effect. And this competition leads to interesting behavior and for instance, quantum criticality. So that can be, that's typically visualized in, in terms of the donut diagram, which just compares this uh, extra exponential dependence of the condo, condo interaction, uh, exponential dependence with the uh, antiferromagnetic exchange coupling between uh, F electrons and mass electrons compared to this J squared uh, uh, dependence of the archaic Y interaction. So the indirect exchange coupling via polarization of the conduction electrons. And now for low values of J, as we see here, the archaic Y interaction dominates and we expect the magnetically ordered ground state. While if we enhance J, for instance, by compressing the lattice in the serum case, we uh, strengthen the condo interaction, and then we expect that we uh, get a uh, that we pass the quantum critical point where the magnetic order gets suppressed when we end in a paramagnetic cross. Now, that's not the whole story. There is also, of course, the F electron decrease of freedom, which may change. And so, clearly, if the condo interaction is very small, we will deal with localized four F electrons. While if the condo interaction is highly dominant, we expect itinerant F electrons, so the F electrons will contribute to the family surface, and therefore this family surface is called large and that one is small. And now we have different uh, possibilities what may happen near the magnetic quantum critical point. So one proposal is the so-called condo breakdown scenario, which would here be trajectory one, where we would have the transition from a large to a small family surface at exactly the same point where the system is getting magnetically ordered. But uh, we could also think about different scenarios, namely one where we first have a spin density wave instability of the large Fermi surface where the magnetic order sets in. So we would have an anti ferromagnetic ground state with the large Fermi surface, and then another separation towards here, the side with a negligible condo interaction where we get a transition to anti ferromagnetic state with small Fermi surface. Or we may even think about the opposite possibility, namely that the large Fermi surface breaks apart already in the paramagnetic state. And that would leave a very interesting phase, a paramagnetic uh, a state with a small Fermi surface. And the idea is that this could only be stabilized if we somehow weaken the condo synclet formation by strong uh, quantum fluctuations, as we may induce them, for instance, by magnetic, by geometrical magnetic frustration. And, and so we, you can also think about, about, about a, a finite temperature phase diagram where we have a magnetic order phase and you can depress the magnetic order either in these condo systems by just enhancing condo coupling, or you can also do it uh, as a function of magnetic frustration. And this works of course even in the, in the, in the non-metallic case that uh, frustration is getting stronger and stronger and you suppress the order and this results in a spin liquid phase. And so now the combination of these two scenarios in case of geometrically frustrated heavy thermal systems is really interesting because this new uh, exotic ground state hey, is predicted. Sorry, the just, uh, sorry yeah. just a quick uh, clarification. So in this part two that you specify there is an antiferromagnet. Why does it have a large Fermi surface? Wouldn't, have a, wouldn't it have a Fermi surface reconstruction because of the now, ordering? Of course, there setting? is a Fermi surface reconstruction, but the, it's called okay. large in the sense that the F electrons still contribute. So the okay. F electrons okay. are still it itinerant, and therefore we I call see. it large. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. That's a very valid question. Thanks. 
And yeah, so and 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 so by the help of frustration, the the idea is or the vision is that we may realize a state which has which features some kind of uh, spin charge separation because the the charges would be localized. The charges of the four elect four electrons would be localized if it's a small family surface, but the spins are fluctuating and forming a liquid a spin liquid phase, and that's also called the fractionalized family liquid. And there is a there is a strong a hint, a strong hunt for um, us experimentalists to find materials which may realize such a fractionalized thermal liquid uh, state for which also un, un, unusual uh, quantum critical behaviors have been predicted. And that's a, a motivation to look for um, condo lattice metals where the 4F electrons are located on frustrated lattices and this zirconium nickel aluminum structure type with the with the um, with the perfect triangular units which are connected in a in a Kagami lattice, although it's distorted, the, the, the nearest neighbor coupling is uh, is frustrated and, and therefore there is a strong motivation to look for condo lattice systems in this of this structure type. And one of the um, one of the prototype members of this family class is of course serum palladium aluminium, which was studied since uh, since more than 25 years. And in particular, the, uh, the neutron scattering experiments uh, revealed that there is a, uh, an anti-ferromagnetic state developing at 2.7 Kelvin, which doesn't involve all the theorem sites and which leaves one theorem site uh, fluctuating, not participating in the long range order. The, the order consists of such um, corrugated anti-ferromagnetic sheets which possibly then result in, in frustration on this middle position. So we have in each plane, uh, a quasi ferromagnetic coupling along this direction. And those spins, it's believed that those spins here do not order because they undergo the, the geometrical frustration as indicated here. Now, more recently, we, uh, we were asking ourselves how we can define actually magnetic frustration in, in, in such uh, metallic um, heavy fermion systems. Because the ordinary frustration parameter which people are using, experimentalists are using for insulating frustrated magnets won't work. So there we typically define as a frustration parameter F, the ratio of a curie bias temperature divided by the actual ordering temperature. And the curie weiss temperature in a, in a insulating frustrated magnets give, gives us the energy scale of the dominating magnetic exchange. But you know, in case of a condo material, you get already um, the condo scattering order already leads to a modification of the temperature dependence of magnetic susceptibility. And, and the curie weiss temperature is often just a measure of decay, and it has nothing to do with the with the uh, magnetic interside interaction, so it's not suitable to uh, define some magnetic frustration. But instead, we recognize that in at least in the serum palladium aluminum case, the specific heat looks quite unusual above the magnetic transition because you see there is a wide temperature range where it where it, upon cooling it grows, and this is a range where magnetic fluctuations are getting important. And we also found that actually specific heat is proportional to the temperature derivative of the magnetic susceptibility. And we see that the susceptibility or here the magnetization passes a maximum at a temperature Ts, which is much above the ordering temperature. And since uh, the temperature derivative of magnetization equals the field derivative of the entropy, this means that this, uh, the line of this uh, magnetization maxima actually defines a line where the entropy is maximized. So it's, a, it's an entropy inflection point, which we see here. And this is, and, and so our idea is that the, the system, if it wouldn't be geometrically frustrated, would actually form the ordered state at this entropy inflection point. So that, so, so that Ts would be the true magnetic ordering temperature if it wouldn't be frustrated. And so we can define a new frustration parameter, which is just the ratio of this expected ordering temperature divided by the actual ordering temperature. And if we now apply the magnetic fields and follow this uh, frustration parameter, we see that it uh, enormously grows as we enter the series of different anti magnetic states by field in this uh, material. And furthermore, we can also 
uh, follow the evolution with pressure of this entropy accumulation point. And that's shown here out of that study. And we see that the, um, this, um, this temperature, which is an indicator below which the uh, spin liquid correlations may start, this uh, disappears at a critical pressure, which is uh, almost uh, twice as large as the critical pressure for the long range antiferromagnetic order. So we may, and also we, we see here a fourth color in this, in this uh, phase diagram that the electrical resistance exponent in this intermediate pressure stage is about 1.5. So we see a non-thermal liquid behavior in this pressure region between the two critical pressures for zero and palladium iron. And that was motivation to look more carefully now with uh, microscopic uh, probes what happens under pressure in silver and palladium aluminium. And we did with Mayuk this uh, study of the Muir's are under pressure. So first he could uh, confirm that the long range ordered state uh, disappears below 1.1 1 gigapascal, while the, uh, while the signature of magnetic frustration uh, is, is present up to much higher pressures. So the zero field Muir's are spectra were fitted by such a complicated form where the, um, where the exponent beta, where it deviates from one, uh, the, the so-called stretch exponential behavior starts. And that's an indicator in general in geometrically frustrated magnets for the onset of spin liquid correlations. And interestingly, we found that the onset of this, uh, this stretch exponential behavior agrees very well with the uh, entropy uh, maximum that is detected from the magnetic susceptibility under pressure. So this line defines the onset of our spin liquid correlations. And then we also try to look for indications of a non-thermal liquid behavior and quantum criticality in this pressure regime. And we found in the longitudinal field MERS R spectra, some interesting uh, time over field scaling as indicated here, which indeed indicates a quantum critical behavior quantum critical scaling in this uh, pressure range between the first and the second critical pressure. So the, uh, the idea now here is that we have an extended pressure range where spin liquid correlations uh, remain and where we see quantum criticality. And so that may be an indication for this quantum critical spin liquid in such a geometrically frustrated uh, condor lattice. I think I have still about five or 10 minutes remaining. So then I would now turn to the third topic and that would be to ask whether magnetic frustration may even be relevant if we consider the case where TK is very, very large. So we, where we are well on the right-hand side in Donia's diagram. And this is the case for serum iridum tin, which is again an isostructural sister compound with the serum atoms on this reported cagomelatis. But here, according to spectroscopy, we really have a very strong uh, valence fluctuating uh, behavior. So we have uh, as much as 16% 4F0 configuration we see at, uh, at 60 Kelvin in the synchrotron spectroscopy experiment. So that's a material which is deep in the valence fluctuating regime. And so it was really um, uh, a very, um, very surprising for us to observe that when we, when we did um, thermal expansion experiments, to observe that the thermal expansion coefficient in this material upon cooling actually gets negative at low temperatures. Because a negative sign in serum systems, we typically only have within a magnetically ordered regime. You know, the sign of the thermal expansion is related via the Grüneisen relation with the pressure dependence of the characteristic energy scale. And typically for paramagnetic heavy fermions, the sign of alpha is always positive because the condor scale is getting enhanced with pressure and condor scale is the dominating scale. So only if we are in a magnetic regime where RKKY interaction over the ratio of RKKY to TK dominates, only then the sign of thermal expansion could become negative. And that this happens in an intermediate valence system at, at below two Kelvin, while the valence fluctuating temperatures about 500 Kelvin, this really came through as a surprise to us. But from the large size of this anomaly, also as a metamagnetic anomaly in a magnetic field in the magnetostriction, we saw that it really must be intrinsic and not just related 
to a tiny amount of magnetic impurities or some tiny inhomogeneity. And so uh, we were asking again our collaborators uh, for the Muir's eye, and this time at Rocha did the experiment. He studied the Muir's eye and he, he confirmed the emergence of anti um, magnetic correlations at low temperatures in the Muir's eye data, which at low temperature require a fitting with two uh, components. And the component of the, with the slow fluctuations shows a maximum charge just at the same temperature where we see our characteristic minimum in the thermal expansion. So that indicates the emergence of anti-ferromagnetic correlations at two Kelvin in this material, which is, which is uh, really uh, uh, two orders of magnitude energy lower than the valence fluctuating energy scale of 480 Kelvin in this material. And there is also a related system material, cerium rhodium tin, where we just replaced the rhodium by the isoelectronic rhodium. In the rhodium case, the TK is about half of the size, like in the rhodium. And in the uh, rhodium case, we can also induce negative thermal expansion under in-plane um, in uh, uh, compression. And we also observed that the in-plane thermal expansion coefficient shows the divergence as if we had a, <coughs> a, a quantum critical point, which is tuned by the in-plane uh, unitary pressure. And this may be actually the hint that the geometrical frustration, which is of course modified as you apply the pressure in plane, is, 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 is very important in determining the ground state of this material flow. So, so the remarkable observation and the task for theory, of course, now is also to understand how we could have the um, such emergence of magnetic, uh, of magnetic moments with antiferromagnetic couplings deep in the intermediate valence regime. But we wouldn't have expected them. And so our uh, pre preliminary expectation may be that the uh, geometrical frustration competes with the condor simplet formation. And as a result of this competition, some, uh, some, uh, some magnetic degrees of freedom are emerging at low energies. All right, so um, now I should uh, come to the summary. So I discussed uh, three different members of this family of um, 4F electron based uh, uh, Kagome magnets, which, which have a, a, also conduction electrons, so which are metallic. And in case of Holmerzel germanium, I showed you that the different magnetic phases, which we uncovered by neutron scattering, all fulfill the Kagome ice rule. And that actually the crowd, the crown state is exactly the same as predicted by theory for the 2D Kagome spin ice. And the uh, magnetotransport data that indicated here, the, the anomalous Hall effect shows, uh, reveals an, an interesting difference at the magnetic plateau states, which uncovers uh, time reversal like the hidden degeneracy. While the quantum interaction is negligibly small in case of Holm observer germanium, we also discussed the, the, the condo systems on this structure type. And in serum palladium aluminum, I showed you evidence for a um, finite regime in the temperature pressure phase diagram where we have uh, spin liquid correlations proven by Muir's R and where we also see quantum critical behavior. So that's a type of quantum critical spin liquid. While for the serum iridium tin, which is a material located deep in the intermediate valence regime, a condor breakdown may be responsible for the emergence of, uh, of uh, low energy anti ferromagnetic correlations at very low temperatures. All right, so that's essentially the end of my talk, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Thank you, Philip. Let's thank Philip for the nice talk. <laughs> Questions? Uh, both from in house participants and as well as online. I, I have a question. Do you hear sure. me? Yeah, please. Yes, I can uh, hear you. Okay, this, is, yeah. this is Frédéric Mila from Lausanne. Nice, uh, to nice talk, uh, Philippe. Sorry if I missed it. Did you measure the specific heat and did you find the missing entropy as was done earlier in the, in the uh, spin eyes? In that Kagome, in the, I'm talking about the first system you. Yes. Uh, so, in case of the. Uh, of the Holmium silver germanium, we don't have an indication of missing entropy. So we started the 
me let me see whether I find I could quickly open our paper and show you the specific plot. If you just give me a couple of seconds. Sorry, I should have opened the the papers before to be quicker. So let's share the screen. All right, so this is the specific heat, the different transitions in the specific heat. There is also a broad um, peak above the magnetic order, and then there is distinct signatures at the two transitions. And we uh, calculated the entropy, and I don't think we have a, I mean, of course there is, a, there is some uncertainty due to the phonon subtraction, but it doesn't seem that a substantial fraction, at least on this scale, which, which is enormous, R ln 17, that a large, a large amount of entropy is missing. I mean, what has to be in mind, these are large uh, spin orbit coupled moments. We have the crystal field splitting. And, and as I mentioned, only the four lowest singlets contribute to the magnetic order. So, so we have, I think, R log four collected at Tn, and we need to measure up to much higher temperature to collect the full magnetic entropy. But I, but I think we don't have clear indication for some missing entropy in this case. Although it's difficult to see because we have this large amount of uh, total magnetic entropy available from the 10 for F electrons. Okay, thank you. Okay, more questions uh, online and people here. So uh, I have a, a short question about the last part, the cerium uh, iridium compound. So the mm -hmm. uh, so maybe I missed. Uh, but how uh, two-dimensional is the electronic physics of these materials? Or uh, well, the um, metallic behavior is quite three-dimensional. Of course, there is some anisotropy in the electrical resistance, but it's moderate, I would say. So it's not even factor two. So we cannot, we couldn't call them two D. Uh, the electron electronic structure certainly is not two dimensional. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. So it's the magnetic moments which are which are placed on a lattice side, which is right. geometrically frustrated. The, and and of course now in the condor systems you have your f moments on this side, and that's the idea that the that this geometrical frustration may counteract the condor singlet formation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh yeah, one more question here. Uh, about the holmium compound, uh, I guess if you go below one Kelvin, you should be seeing some effect of uh, nuclear spins, right? Do you see something like that? Um, we haven't seen yet the, I mean, we didn't measure specific heat at millikelvin temperatures, so or we didn't study nuclear contribution but if you so go on. below one kelvin i think it's already in the hyperfine energy i mean scale. yeah possibly what we see what i what i didn't mention yet is that the there is also a c axis component of the magnetic moments and this orders at about 1 kelvin or so 1.5 kelvin so there is another order which doesn't influence the in plane kagome spin i structure which i showed you but which involves the c axis component that's still ongoing but it will be interesting, as you mentioned, to also see the potential coupling with the nuclear moments. So this we didn't investigate so far. Yeah, okay, thanks thank very you. much. For Are there more questions uh, from people here online? OK. If not, let's thank Philip once more for the nice talk. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks Philip. Thanks. So that brings us to the end of this session. And uh, 
So uh, we now have tea and coffee, and we have a longest session. Uh, so at 5 p.m., uh, we meet uh, for the last talk of the day by Rebook All. So it'll be great uh, if all of you could be here slightly before 5. In an hour, exactly in an hour. <laughs> <laughs>